about those kinds of issues? Because what if the barcode gets mangled? What if it gets ripped or torn or doesn't work anymore or whatever? So you, you really like those two things to be the same. <coughs> the barcode is a contextual identifier in this sense. It identifies something uniquely in this type, in type of collection, but may not be unique. So these are Yale Peabody numbers. There are different vials inside this jar. And clearly, those by themselves are unique inside the Yale database. But they would not necessarily be outside the database in that form. But you still need them. You need to store them. It's very important, but you need a little bit more. So a database may have several identifiers. They may or may not be unique. They're all important uh, in your database. You may have a barcode field, you may have a catalog number field, which may or may not be the same as a barcode. Uh, more and more people are assigning these uh, like pink identifiers <coughs> to their and notice I call this a specimen identifier, even though you, you may or may not ever go back and actually put that big long string physically on that specimen in your database, you can then go look up by catalog number or look up by barcode and you would see this new UID. These are for and aggregate all this data. You'll also have a record ID. A digital record in your database has a unique identifier for that record in your database. So it's important that these are persistent, meaning it's up to us, just like the character physical collections, we have to learn to care for these identifiers in our digital collections. We need to ensure that when we're creating these kinds of specimen identifiers and record identifiers and things that they're as globally unique as we can make them. And perhaps they're resolvable. Perhaps they, uh, if we put an HTTP URL in front of that, we may be able to do that. We might not. And once you've got all these things and they're out there, hopefully the result is that you're going to get information back. You're going to get feedback. People are going to see your stuff and want to make a comment, um, want to annotate your objects. And projects like Filter Push, uh, which we can talk more about, and Scattered Gap Reconcile and Bicycle are out there to help us make connections between objects, uh, make assertions, tell us that we have duplicates, um, to make our data richer. And this is the point of the linked data or so called semantic web that old publications will then be findable, and field notebooks, all these other documents that we would like to all repatriate with our specimens and make past connections and future connections possible. When you update your database, and we have seen examples of this, keep in mind, it's really important to kind of, if you don't understand your database very well, ask somebody before you do an update that might affect how your identifiers are made or stored. Um, if they're a conglomerate, if, uh, for example, if you're doing a Darwin for a triplet, and it's one of those things that when you press enter and you export your data, it takes your institution code field from over here and your collection code field from over here, catalog them from up here and concatenate them together. But maybe you don't have a field in your database that actually stores that trip. And somebody decides to join viralrepositories.org or viral collections index and register, and they decide they're going to change their collection code. Now when they go into their database and they update their collection code field, because, oh, I just joined, and I'm going to update that field. Next time they export their data, they have a new Darwin board trip. But only the institutional memory inside their head of what the old one used to be. It's not stored anywhere physically in your database. The ideal situation is that you would store the old one and you really wanted to do that. And when you export your data, you're going to say, this is my new Darwin Core triplet, and by the way, this is my old one. So that way, if the data was already exposed <coughs> to public under the old identifier and already published that way, then those objects will still find. So we would like to get all these things to work together, all these different projects, which you may be familiar with some and not others, but uh, the basic point is to get them all to work together, we need these. One of the ways we need to, uh, in order to be able to share them, is we need standards. Because we need to be able to say, what identifiers I'm sharing? Is it that I'm sharing? What does it mean? Is it a catalog number? Is it a specimen identifier? Is it a record identifier? So the Darwin Core standard, how many people do not know what the Darwin Core is? Don't get it. So a vocabulary term so that we're all speaking the same language when we share our data. Is every possible field there for us? No. Uh, some of you who know about ABCD, doesn't have every field we need either. Things like host parasite relationships that people want to share, um, they're also working on sending ABCD. Don't 
think about whether or not it's proprietary. If that's going to be an ongoing recurring cost you're going to have to figure out. Or whether it's cloud-based so that anyone anywhere sitting at home, your students sitting at home and then their data, um, or whether or not they have to physically be where you are. And if it needs new features, can you work on those with your IT staff, or do you have to wait for the people who own the software to do that? Sometimes, other people in your community are already using particular software, and so there's lots of people already going to use it. So it would be nice to um, use that too. Perhaps it's easier for you to share data, it's easier for you to discuss about your, your issues. So look around and see what's out there, and take your handy list that you've made and see which one suits your needs best. Use a test data set and also test people. And there's a concept that the information scientists made us aware, some people alluded to it, but there's this concept of user interfaces being intuitive, somehow user interfaces being easier than others. But in reality, it turns out that while that's partially true, what's really true is that if I sit down with somebody who's very fast with computers, who has lots of different pieces of software, and is very comfortable at the keyboard, and doesn't have any trouble finding the end, then I sit them in front of a piece of software and they'll say, oh, this is great. It's very easy. I didn't have any trouble getting around here. I found everything I wanted. You sit somebody down who's not as comfortable, who doesn't really understand relational databases, who hasn't done as much of this kind of work ever beforehand, who doesn't have the concepts, and they say, oh, I didn't understand where to find anything, and I didn't understand why this is over here. And you're like, is this the same piece of software? So think about when you're evaluating that aspect as well, because that will give you a hint, because you're going to know who your users are going to be to some extent, and how much time it's also going to take you to train. So uh, don't be surprised that in that case you can get very different um, reviews of your software. So some of the other things to consider in this long list here uh, that have to do with costs have to do with some of the things we've already talked about. And some of that also has to do with who you have on um, your have somebody in your program, or if you've written it into your TCN proposal, do you have IT staff that can help you manage your software? Or are you always going to have to go out for that or hire that or find somebody on your university campus to help you? Um, and it, it really helps if you have somebody who knows the biodiversity and genetics issues, who understands our data sets and not just the IT part. It's very, very, very helpful. And the last thing I would like to talk about, because I understood that a lot of people here were all on the capital base, is this concept of digitization maturity, which comes out of the work of the Australian um, Living Atlas, the ALA project. And this is the work of Brian Collins. So digitization maturity. And this is not uh, an A to F sort of thing. This is a scale, but it's just meant as an evaluation. And you may want to be here, right where you're at when you use the scale. Uh, it's just a way to let you look at digitization as a broader thing and where you fit in your uh, museum or your institution and where you fit on a broader scale in the digitization community. So I know you can't read this yet, perhaps, but just wait one minute. So I made a tiny URL So the bottom of this is full of disorganized. Nobody has any idea what's happening across the organization and the digitization is left to individuals. So you may see this, a large institution or a small one. Every single department is doing their own thing. One has a file pro, somebody else is using access, somebody else is using specify, somebody else is just all over the place. And they don't talk to each other about what they're doing or how it works or anything. So you may not. Or no one may be digitizing at all. Uh, all the way up to the top where So sometimes people are making do. Digitization is done by each individual group or even an individual person. It begins to change as organizations 